Hi, my name is Benjamin Terrier. I'm a professor of medicine in Paris, France, and I'm uh, the head of the French vasculitis study group, and uh, I will uh, talk today about uh, the diagnosis of EGPA, um, this uh, m complex disease, which is the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So, as you probably know, uh, EGPA is really a diagnostic challenge because the presentation uh, of the patients may be vast and heterogeneous, especially uh, for those um, um, having the ANCA, the antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, and those that does not have the ANCA. And also, some of the manifestations can be transient and complicated to formally link uh, with the underlying disease. Uh, across the, the, the group of uh, vasculitis, and especially antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies related vasculitis, uh, EGPA is very rare, with an annual incidence ranging from uh, roughly 1 to 2 per million to up to uh, 10 to 15 uh, million um, cases per million. So uh, EGPA, the diagnosis is challenging, especially because it's rare, and uh, an early diagnosis is really important to improve uh, the diagnosis, the prognosis, and to decrease, for instance, the sequelae of the disease. Many different manifestations can uh, um, be present at disease presentation, uh, but some of them are quite uh, more common for this disease. Um, uh, Long-term history of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps is really frequent, as well as the worsening late onset asthma. And just as a reminder, uh, people with a diagnosis of EGPA uh, had a long-term history uh, of asthma for uh, around nine to 10 years before the diagnosis of the vasculitis component and the EGPA. Uh, there is a, almost a constant eosinophilia for which there is no obvious cause, no drugs, no um, infection with parasites, uh, and some other manifestations which are, can be more related to the vasculitis component of the disease may be present, especially the peripheral nerve with paresthesia, motor weakness, for instance. There is also a skin involvement quite frequent with uh, purpura, for instance, and recurrent petechia, uh, but also urticaria, and many other manifestations that are related either to the vasculitis or the infiltration by eosinophils can be, uh, can be present. Many different classification criteria were defined during the last 30 years. The first one was the criteria from Lanham uh, in 1984, and more recently, uh, some uh, classification criteria were defined uh, commonly by the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism. So it will be the SCR EULAR 2022. Uh, criteria and what is what is clearly important about this classification criteria it's that it, it, it's uh, they are not uh, diagnosis criteria they are made to distinguish EGPA from the other vasculitis and they are uh, they require the proof of vasculitis to uh, be used um, showing uh, that it's really uh, a way to distinguish the vasculitis between each other. If we do a focus on the last uh, and the most recent uh, classification criteria from the ULAR and the SCR, what is really important, um, it's, it is um, required to uh, use this classification criteria in patients having a diagnosis of small vessel and or medium-sized vessel vasculitis. And it's very important to have excluded before uh, the main mim mimickers of the disease. For instance, uh, the drug rash with uh, eosinophilia and systemic response, so related to treatments, uh, some infection or other diagnosis, uh, many uh, mimickers of the disease. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, six points at least are required to uh, classify a patient uh, as having an EGPA, 
and um, you have the clinical criteria like the obstructive airway disease, the nasal polyps, and you have also the laboratory and biopsy criteria. And you can see that the serum eosinophil count um, is really important in terms of uh, weight uh, into the, the, the score, but it's important also to remind that EGP is not the only vasculitis uh, showing increased eosinophils. Uh, for instance, uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly called Vegener's granulomatosis, uh, or polyarteritis nodosa are commonly associated with eosinophils and sometimes greater than uh, one um, thousand per millimeter, millimeter cubes. So um, it's very important to uh, take that into, um, into the discussion. You can see here a biopsy from a patient uh, with EGPA showing both some uh, eosinophils into uh, the inflammation and it's commonly admitted to consider that EGPA is an eosinophil rich uh, vasculitis and on the le um, right part of the of the panel you can see also the vasculitis uh, with the arrows showing uh, the necroid uh, the fibrinoid necrosis that is common in the group of ANCA associated vasculitis Lung imaging can be also very useful because it's commonly show uh, either some uh, bronchial wall sickening that will that uh, um, are the traduction of uh, the uh, airway obstructive disease um, and you can have in some patients and especially zoos uh, with an, an important eosinophilic infiltration into the tissues some uh, peripheral ground glass opacities in both lungs especially uh, in the subpleural uh, space in terms of laboratory findings, you have uh, you can also uh, very frequently see some elevated blood eosinophils, uh, but you have to take into account that uh, very few days of glucocorticoids that can be started from uh, the GP, for instance, or another practitioners uh, could lower the blood eosinophil count in only few days. Um, the the positive ANCA. Uh, the ANCA, the antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, uh, usually targeting the myeloperoxidase, can be seen in roughly one third of the patient, what means that the majority of the patients with EGPA have no positive ANCA. It's frequently uh, associated with elevated IgE levels and IgG4, what are some uh, um, features that are commonly found in uh, uh, TA in type 2 inflammation. And finally, and it's an important feature that uh, distinguish EGPA from other eosinophilic disease like hyperizonophilic syndrome, is that there is an increased uh, C-reactive protein and uh, uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate at the active phase of the disease. So um, I will be glad to discuss uh, some point about this diagnostic criteria, uh, the, the challenge that it represents, and also uh, some of the conditions that can mimic EGPA. Benjamin, th thank you very much. I think that was a very clear presentation. I wonder if I could just ask one or two questions. You, you highlight the importance of early diagnosis and... As a clinician, are there any sort of patterns of uh, presentation that, that might alert you to think more about the diagnosis? What is challenging with uh, EGPA is that frequently there is a long-term history of asthma and nasal polyposis, which is very frequent in the general population. And so that's why it's very complicated to define what could be the exact time um, of the diagnosis. But uh, so I think what the, are the main points that could alert you for that is that there was some study showing that in the months previous the diagnosis of EGPA, the 
asthma was more and more refractory to the treatments and complicated to manage, there was an increase uh, in the eosinophil count, which was, you know, for instance, during asthma around 500, maybe 1000, but there was an increase, an acceleration of the, of the eosinophil count. And also, as soon as you have some extra pulmonary manifestations like paresthesia, uh, which can be really only sensory manifestations, some urticaria or uh, petechia, uh, I think it's the main manifestations that could alert you. But clearly, there is a phase during which we see that there is uh, an acceleration of the asthma and the nasal polyposis and we suspect to be, you know, at the, at the time just before maybe, um, before the change to the, and the evolution towards the GPA. So it's clearly the worsening of the uh, obstructive airway disease and also if you have some uh, extra pulmonary manifestations. No, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. And just, just uh, in terms of the benefits of anchor testing, you know, often we, we do that, and obviously if it's positive, it gives you some firm guidance. But what proportion of patients, you know, who turn out to have eGPA would, would actually have negative anchor tests? So um, there was uh, some um, uh, consensus uh, discussion about the use, of, uh, the, the use of anchor in eGPA that were published in EGRCCM maybe two years ago, and it was reminded that one-third of the patients have positive ANCA and two-thirds of, of the patients have no ANCA. Right. So um, it's really important because it's sometimes confusing because it's an ANCA-associated vasculitis, but the patients are more frequently ANCA negative than ANCA positive. That's the first point. We know also that uh, the patients with positive ANCA have usually some quite different manifestations from those with negative ANCA, especially for, for the alveolar hemorrhage, from glomerulonephritis, mononeuritis multiplex, which is more frequent in ANCA positive patients. And on the opposite, cardiomyopathy, lung infiltrates are more frequent in the ANCA negative patients. But it's not a clear-cut situation, it means that you can have both manifestations according to the type of ANCA. And this uh, consensus discussion um, about ANCA testing also said that ANCA is useful and should be performed in all patients suspected of eGPA, but so far they, they should not be used to, you know, to, 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 to orientate which treatments you should prefer. Mm -hmm. So far it's a uh, tool for the diagnosis and potentially the prognosis, but not for the management so far of the disease. Thank you. And you know, I also noticed in, in your um, summary slide, you pointed out that, that while blood eosinophils are normally a good guide, people on oral corticosteroids, which they may be for their severe asthma, may, may mask that as a diagnostic consideration. So. You know, it, as a clinician, one has to be thinking of these things uh, to push yourself towards the potential diagnosis of eGPA. No, no, I totally agree that, in fact, uh, before the, the patients being referred to a secondary or a tertiary, or tertiary uh, referral centers, uh, they are frequently treated because of the worsening of the manifestations, and sometimes the patients... Uh, self-treat themselves because they they know that they experienced some exacerbations before. And so clearly, um, a few days of steroids could completely decrease uh, the eosinophil count. And it's really important to take that into account because eosinophil is really a major diagnostic criteria, as you saw in the last classification criteria, and considering a diagnosis of eGPA without this increased eosinophil, it's really tough, except if you know that the patient was treated with corticosteroids before. Thank you. And, and you know, finally, you, know, you highlighted the ACR-ULAR 
uh, criteria is moving on from the sort of Chapel Hill criteria. Um, but I, I note that does involve, first of all, having a proven vasculitis on a, a biopsy. And, you know, just for the clinicians listening in to this podcast, I, I think it'd be valuable to know whether you'd recommend a, a biopsy in all patients, and if so, is, is there a preferred site to obtaining the biopsy from? I totally agree that uh, what is complicated with all these classification criteria is the requirement for, the, for an evidence, histological evidence of biopsy. And that's why some uh, uh, inclusion criteria in the larger studies conducted so far um, a few years ago um, use some uh, more, you know, practical uh, criteria uh, that were not uh, requiring a biopsy because that's clear that the majority of patients with the GPA, in contrast to poly microscopic polyangiitis or GPA, um, uh, have no uh, clear uh, evidence on the on the biopsy. But clearly, what is really uh, a good sight is the skin because the, the skin manifestations, when you look at them, uh, look for them, they are quite frequent around half of the patients, and it can be sometimes really mild manifestations, but it can show the vasculitis and the eosinophil-rich uh, infiltration. And uh, one of the main other uh, sites is the nerve, the peripheral nerve, especially in those with peripheral neuropathy. Oh, th thank you. Oh, thank you very much indeed.